Okay, thank you, Shane. All right, so we're gonna talk about practical purchasing today. And what I mean by that is how do we take this tool that we have in SXE and Cloud Suite distribution and bring it down to a manageable, workable, successful size. So we're gonna talk about some practical ways to take care of your purchasing requirements in your business. So with that, I'm gonna start with just what the goals of practical purchasing are. And basically what we wanna make sure is that we have a plan because a goal without a plan is just a wish. So our plan should include that we are sure that existing inventory will be used. And when I talk about inventory on the shelf, we address the, the consideration of carrying cost. What does it cost to keep that product? So we only want product on our shelves that's actually going to sell and be useful wherever possible. We also want to make sure that what is not inventory is not needed. And that, of course, is balancing out keeping our customers from being disappointed or worst case even from losing them as customers altogether. We want to be able to identify and, and eliminate obsolete items and stock. Nothing good comes from carrying dead stock. It can get lost, damaged, become obsolete, unsellable. So we want to make sure that we can identify obsolete products and know what to do with them. And then, of course, we want to purchase from the right suppliers at the right time. And by right suppliers, I mean suppliers who give us a fair price and who are dependable. They ship when they say they're going to ship. They have the products that we need on the shelf or easily available to get to us. So we're looking to purchase from the right suppliers as well. So we're gonna start with a pretty big topic here and I'm gonna bring it up on the screen. Um, this is EOQ stands for economic order quantity. And what I wanna talk about is we show this big square root formula because economic order quantity helps us determine how much to order. And it does use this big calculation um, to find out how much you should order. And it is using both <clears throat> cost to replenish and cost to carry, or our K cost, our keep cost, as uh, part of the formula. Because what we're trying to do is balance cost to serve with customer retention, right? We don't want to have so much product on the shelf that we're paying high levels of carrying cost. And by carrying cost, for those of you who aren't aware of the term, it takes into consideration things like taxes, warehouse space, shrinkage, um, all of those things that are actually piles of cash on the shelf when you're looking at inventory. You've already paid for it and it's sitting there and you, it's just money that keeps accumulating every month with cost to carry. Hey, Julie, real quick, are, mm -hmm. I, I got a note from Samantha that she can't hear anything. Is can that anyone on, else hear me? Is that on her end? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. I can hear you just fine. Okay. Good here. Okay. I, okay. We're in good shape then. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. The other cost that we're balancing is the cost to purchase. So when we talk about cost to purchase, it's the cost of putting a product on a PO line. And it's a dollar amount for every line you put on your, your PO. And what that's trying to balance is that we're not ordering from our vendor every day. We're not creating a purchase order too often because that, that stimulates other activities in our location. So that would be your accounts payable department can't keep up with the volume of invoices they're trying to match to POs or receiving can't keep up with the volume of purchase orders that are being received every day. So we want to keep in mind that we don't want to be ordering too often, just in time for what we need. And that's what SXE and Cloud Suite distribution is so excellent at managing for you. The system can do this math for you. You don't have to know this formula, right? And it's going to recommend um, the right amount to order. So let me just bring up Cloud Suite for a minute. Um, 
And of course, I am working in Cloud Suite distribution. So I'm in the web version. And of course, I'm always on the latest version when I'm in Cloud Suite. So all of the new features are here always. So I'm just going to bring up a warehouse product and show you as an example what, where that field is that I'm talking about. So let's just bring up this product in this warehouse. And on the ordering tab, and of course, this is a stock product. It, it may, we may not always have stock, but we intend to use replenishment on this product. And that's what this status setting is. So the choices here, of course, are stock or order as needed or direct ship or do not reorder, don't ever get it again, right? But a stock product is one where we want the system to recalculate for us. We want the system to give us advice. And if we go to the ordering tab, this is the field that I'm talking about for your order method. And as a default, we usually recommend economic order quantity as your method for replenishment. But there are times when economic order quantity is not the right answer. So I just want to give you some tips here on when it's best to use economic order quantity as your order method. And remember, this method has to do with how much you're going to order. It's using that calculation. So when is it best to use EOQ? Well, first of all, if your vendor's minimum is attainable. Um, so that's important. You also want products where your usage rate is normally recurring. So more than one half unit per month is usually the rule of thumb. When you don't get quantity breaks from your vendor, because economic order quantity may recommend ordering, you know, seven of something and you get a break at 10, right? So that wouldn't be the best method. You also want to consider if you have any guaranteed inventory level commitments to your customers. So if you have a, a commitment, whether verbal or written, that you're going to have 10 of this product on the shelf, you know, you've made a commitment and economic order quantity may suggest that you have five, right? So that's another consideration when EOQ may not be the best method. And then lastly, we should take the cost of the product into consideration. So if the product cost is very minimal or extremely high, economic order quantity may not be the best method and is not recommended. So let's look at a couple of things. I always tell buyers that when they're determining how to buy their products, they should look at the characteristics of their products in their warehouse. So for example, you might have a product and I'm gonna look for one here. Um, I'm gonna use this one. You may have a product in your warehouse. It's a stock product, but its cost is very minimal. Like this product is only 75 cents a piece, right? And if I look at my usage and everything, and I look at, it's a normally recurring, we sell a lot of it every month right? So it's normally recurring, but it's a little product. I have enough room for it if I buy it in a large quantity, and it's a small dollar amount. So this might be a product where I might want to always have one year's worth. I'll buy a year at a time, so I don't have to think about it so often, right? As long as I have room for it on the shelf, and it's a small dollar value item, doing that would make sense. So this is what I would recommend for this type of product. All right, so I would change the method from EOQ to class, all right? And the reason I'm doing that will make sense in a minute, but I'm gonna go down to the field here where class is set, and it's right here. And normally the classification happens every month. The system will recalculate your classes for you and just to re remind you what they are, you can have a class one through 13 item, 13 would be dead stock. But if I wanted to set this to buy a year at a time, uh, a 12 month supply at a time, if I put 12 here and I freeze it so that my month end doesn't change it, it's always gonna tell me when it's time to order 
to buy 12 months worth. Now to prove it out, let me bring up the calculator here, just so you can see the practicality of this. Um, if we looked at the usage on this product, which was here, so we have 283.33 per month times 12 months, it's going to calculate out to 3399.96. So in my case, it rounded it up to the order quantity of 3400. This is just a suggestion. You don't have to do this, obviously, but if you wanted to do this, this would be a good way that you could you could um, meet that goal of you know not spending so much time creating POs, get the cheap products in as long as you have room for them on the shelf and buy a, a year's worth at a time. Okay, so that was my first practical tip. All right, now let's look at the reverse. Let's look at a product where the cost is high. So let's look at a different one here. And again, all I'm doing is looking at the characteristics of my products and then determining the best method for ordering them. So if we look at this product, it is a stock product. When I drill into it, I can see that I have it set as EOQ, but when I roll down here, my usage rate is less than a half unit a month. I, I only sell 0.4 a month of this product. Let's go up for a minute and just look at the cost. And here's the cost, they're $3,500 a piece. So that's a big difference, right? So for something like that, I might say, I don't want to keep this on the shelf. I, I maybe have to keep one, but I don't want to keep a lot of this because it's expensive. So in this case, what I would recommend we do, oh, and by the way, with less than a half unit a month, the system would have calculated the usage as, as zero. Don't, don't buy any, right? It's not, it, it would say it's not worthy of replenishment. But if I do want to keep one on the shelf, maybe for a customer commitment, I could set my threshold minimum order point here to be a one. So, and of course, anytime you're using these threshold overrides, please put in a reference as to why you're doing it. And in my case, I'm saying I want to order one when the last one is sold. And put an expiration date on them, please don't leave them out here forever because things will change on your products. Even though you have a good idea to start with, it may not be the best idea in September, right? So we wanna keep an eye on it. So if I were to do a recalculate on this product now, and in Cloud Suite, of course, we have this nice recalculate button at the top of the screen. So the system would have calculated it at zero, but when I do a recalculate on it, and I look at it, now it's saying my order point and my line point are one. So, and it is putting this message here saying, the reason it's one and your raw order point, it still shows you what the system would have calculated here is zero. It's gonna tell you it's because you have a threshold order point adjustment set. So it reminds you to, to go down and look at that, right? And when we look at our month end and our exception center, which we're gonna look at as well, um, it tells you when these are due to expire. And that's important for you to know. So you remember to come back and look at this again and see if the circumstance has changed. All right, so that's my tip number two. Use those threshold order minimums if you need to. All right, and finally, let's look at a part, for example, that has, it varies in cost, the part varies in lead time, usage varies monthly, it may be sporadic, but in my case, what I would wanna do with a product like that, and we're gonna bring one up here. Let's just look at it first for cost and so forth. So this is a stock product. If I look at the cost, it's $12.83. So, and it's not such a big deal, right? It's not too cheap, it's not too expensive. When I look at the ordering controls on it, it's set as EOQ right now. 
So it has an, a, a minimum, an order point, and a line point, and an order quantity. And the reason it's set is because our month end process has calculated the those figures for me and populated this screen for me. Um, and we're just stocking to support usage. So our non forecast rate is 18.33 per month. We have a safety allowance on the product. And I'm just going to go into edit mode here for a minute just to point out your safety allowance doesn't have to be a percent. If, if you went live on SXE years ago, your default on every product was 50% safety allowance. And some of you may still have that set in your system. But in all actuality, um, your safety allowance should just be a buffer in case you have an issue with supply where you have a buffer amount. You don't typically hope to, to, to dap, dap, dip into that safety stock, but it's there if you need it. So now you can have not only a percent of safety stock, but you could set a specific quantity. I could say I always want to have three, for example, as my safety, or this is the one I actually prefer is day's supply. So it'll take into consideration how much you would sell daily and keep that much as a buffer. So in my case, it cal I have a two days supply it calculated as one. Um, and so that's, that's my safety. I have no threshold minimums here. And of course it's using my lead time. So in this case with a product that, you know, it has regular normal recurring usage, it has a manageable uh, cost. Um, it has a manageable lead time. I would leave this set to just go EOQ and it would then replenish based on um, whatever we sell. So the system does the calculation for me. Okay. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint for a minute. All right. All right, so these three things are the most important when we talk about replenishment and actually using the features in SXE to the best advantage. You need to talk about safety allowance, which we just said could be quantity, day supply, or a percent. We have to talk about lead time because obviously the longer it takes to get a product, the sooner you need to order it and the more you may need to have of that product. And then your usage rate. And your usage rate is just the average monthly usage. What did you sell each month? Um, so if the buyers can understand where the numbers come from, they can easily predict their order point and line point and understand where those numbers are coming from. And when you're trying to get people to, to buy into using the replenishment system, that's key. They have to trust the numbers. They have to understand where the numbers come from. So let's go through and just look at, um, at where the numbers come from and let's calculate it so that you see what I mean. So we'll go back into Cloud Suite here. Um, I'm gonna go back into this product. I think this is the one I want to use. Yes. All right, so this is the one we said, we're going to let our month end recalculate our order point, line point, order quantity using the EOQ or economic order quantity method. So it calculated our order point as five. Our order point for definition's sake is the point at which you need to order or you are in danger of stocking out. So that means that you know it's waving a flag saying it's time to order. Your line point takes into consideration how much you should order up to to take into consideration how much you're going to use until you plan on ordering again. And that plan on ordering date comes from your review cycle in your product line setup. All right, so we've got a five as our order point and our line point is 14. 
We have no override adjustment reasons. And by the way, this critical point up here, if you're not sure what that is, all it is is your order point minus your safety stock quantity. That's why it's a critical point. It means not only are you at or below your order point, but you're even out of your safety. So that's what critical point means. All right, so let's do some calculations here. So we have our usage rate and to calculate order point, it's a very simple theory. All it is, it's actually a formula. <laughs> All it is is usage times your lead time expressed in days plus your safety allowance. Okay, so keep in mind 18.33 is what our usage is, all right? And if we go down and we look at our lead time, it's six days. Now, the way that the system calculates your daily lead time is it will take, it'll use 28 days as, as a month. So if you take six divided by 28, that's the daily lead time. All right, so usage times that, so we would multiply by our usage, which was 18.33, whoops, not 6.6, 6. 3.3, 3. there we go. It's 3.92 plus our safety allowance. Where is safety? There it is, our safety allowance amount is one. So we add one to that and it comes out to 4.92, which of course the system rounded up to five. So that's how it calculated my, my order point. Mystery solved, right? That's all it is. Usage times lead time expressed in days plus your safety amount and that's your order point. Okay, next thing we wanna calculate is line point. All right, so if we take this number five, and now we look at the usage that we're going to use daily until our review cycle. Now, this review cycle on this, this product is 14 days. I'm in a demo system, and right now I have all my review cycle days at 14, so <laughs> I know it. And a lot of you went live with that as your default. Know that you can change that review cycle day, right? There, there's a lot of reasons why you would. But right now, I know the review cycle days is 14. So I'm going to take my, my um, usage divided by those 28 days, right? And then I'm going to usage during my review cycle. So that's my daily. So now I want to multiply times 14 days. And then I add my order point, which was five and it comes up to 14.16. So there it is, it rounded down in this case to 14. So the numbers are very reasonable to understand, even though you know it's an EOQ calculation for the order quantity, this is what's important for your buyers to understand in practical purchasing. I, I need to order at my order point or I'm gonna stock out. If I'm critical, I'm out of safety, and I should be considering how much I'm gonna use until I buy from this vendor again. That's my line point. Okay, we're good there so far. So the important things here are obviously your safety allowance, your lead time and your usage needs to be right. If you take care of those big three, the system does all the math for you. All right. Let's go next, we're almost there, we're making progress. Okay, so adjusting your ordering controls. How, do you, how can you be sure that your ordering controls are set up properly? So I'm gonna go through a few tips and tricks here of things to look for. Obviously, we're gonna be going back and, and you know, fixing any data issues for our usage, safety, and lead time, the big three, right? But besides that, there's settings in the system that we need to take into consideration. So the first one we're gonna look at is how many months do we use for our usage months looking backwards? Um, there's a setting in the system called your parameters, your replenishment parameters, and you can set 
the usage months based on the rank of your item. So let's look at that real quick. All right, let's close out some things here. So if I look for replenishment parameters, and of course, this is typically um, security restricted area, um, but someone in your organization needs to have access to it so that you can make changes as needed. And I will tell you that there are multiple levels of this replenishment setup. Typically, when you go live on Cloud Suite, you just have a company level, but you can get much more granular with it by warehouse, by vendor, for, by product line, but you have to start somewhere. So typically you start just at, with a company level setting. And in here, you have different hits and ranks. And in most cases, we start you off with five ranks, A, B, C, D, E, with E being dead stock. And your, the detail ranks here explain how these are segregated. So your top movers in that you, you sell it the most, it has the most activity or hits. Um, we would say use a usage month for three months looking backwards. The reason that, this is recommended this way, an A is three months, a B is four months, a C five, a, six, a D six, and of course E we would set at 12 months because it's dead stock, at least now it's dead, right? With each month, this gets updated. Your, your rank on your items get updated monthly as well. There's a month end routine that does re-ranking every month. Um, so if, we, if we're saying it's an A item and we have a lot of activity on it, we want to use a shorter window to see current trending. So that's why it's recommended to use a, a shorter window. Um, people who went live on SXE years ago, you probably started out with six or 12 months. You were always looking backwards, right? If you're using a backward usage method. But now we're saying on an A item, use three months, use a shorter window of time so that you see more current trending. So if I look at one of my products that's an A item, I can see that it'll be ranked. Um, I think this one has got an A item on it, an A rank. You'll see that it'll rank it by the company and also at the warehouse level. So that if you do have different um, parameters and you set up different levels for your settings, you would see the different ranks, right? So this is an A item. So if I look at my usage, you'll see it's already preset to use three months looking backward, okay? So that's where that number is coming from. So that's typically what we recommend that you set up that much in your ranking um, to, uh, to help you see current trending on your top moving items. All right. If in your product recommend uh, parameter settings, which is ICSR for those who like the acronyms, there's a lot of things that can be set here. And if you've attended a Grant Howard session, you know he he you walk away with a, a whole spreadsheet of recommended settings, and people go back after attending and they they put in all of those recommend recommended settings, and sometimes that's too much. And then you can't understand why things are happening the way they do. So let me just show you that at an A level here, if we look at it, you can set up your vendor's minimum safety. Um, and that would be one of the parameters I would caution you to, to always go back and look at because that may not be correct anymore. And it's one of the exceptions you see at month end where your safety um, percentages are outside of the of the minimum and maximum. So it, you could set your safety allowance uh, by rank if you want to. However, you have to commit to going back and updating it if it's not right. Okay, so just because you're starting out with these settings doesn't mean that this is where they should stay. So if you're if you're not understanding why things are happening in your system or where the calculations are coming from, 
I would say you should probably look at how this is set in your system because it may be doing things you're not expecting. There's also some overrides here that it could be fixing things for you automatically. I won't get into all of those settings today. I just want to tell you that this is a place for you to look if things aren't making sense, right? You may want to go back and look here. All right. Um, the other thing that we want to look at on our products where we want to make sure things are right is our units of measure. So again, I'll go into that product we've been looking at. And on your ordering tab, you have a couple of units of measure. You have a buying unit and you have a standard pack. If you have a product with a standard pack, let me see if I can bring one up here. I think this one does. Let's drill into this one because this will make more sense when you see it. All right, so this one, you can buy it as an each, but the standard pack is a pack of six. So when you're in your demand center or you're looking at your recommended action replenishment report or your RAR report, it would round up in multiples of that standard pack. So you wanna make sure that those are set correctly. Um, and this one, this particular product is also a quantity break product. Um, and I brought that up to show you that there are pricing records in your system that you can set up your vendor contracts for these very things where you have a quantity break so that you want to always go to the quantity that gives you the next break, right? So. I don't know how many of you use that, but that is another ordering method that would calculate how much to order based on quantity breaks. All right, back to my plan here. Got a little off track. I tend to go down rabbit holes sometimes. All right, let's talk about this ROQ flag on your product line. If you are using EOQ, it's very important that you set this flag correctly on your product line for the products that are going to be bought in that line. So let me bring that up and show you where that is. Um, and that would be our product line setup screen. And the shortcut, of course, the abbreviation is ICSL. So we'll put it in one warehouse. I'll look at one vendor and I'll drill into one product line here. So what you see here, this is a product line record is where we assign the buyer and we tell the system the rules, whether we're gonna consolidate lines, whether we're gonna auto merge or not. But there's a couple of settings on this screen that I wanna make sure you know about because they're important. The first one is that recommended order quantity. If I scroll down all the way to the bottom here, there's these little check boxes to use recommended order quantity. Um, if you have not set this to a checkbox and you are trying to use EOQ, it's gonna be counterintuitive to you because if you uncheck this, it's gonna calculate your order quantity just by taking your line point minus your purchasing net available. What do I have, what do I have on order? And that's how it's gonna calculate your order quantity. So it, it'll bypass your whole methodology of EOQ. So if you are planning on using EOQ for products in a product line, please make sure that that checkbox is checked. It affects other things too. If you have, um, if you have, let's see if I can show you the couple of things you have this, round up if less than a half unit on the on the RAR. But in the RAR, there's also this question about whether you want to use halfway rounding rules. If you have a class one through four product, um, <clears throat> it's going to use the halfway rounding rule provided that ROQ button is checked. So it would take that, it's a complicated situation to understand. Just know that if you're planning on using the halfway rule, you have to have that ROQ box checked, okay? All right, 
So that was a little complicated, <laughs> but that's another setting you have to make sure is right to use replenishment properly. All right, back here. All right, we talked about units of measure, your cost to buy, um, make sure you, your costs are up to date because your cost is part of your calculation in your EOQ formula or your methodology. If it's a cheap product, I'm gonna buy a year's worth at a time. You wanna make sure your costs are updated. And of course, of course, your authorized replenishment path needs to be set correctly. That's of course critical, whether you buy it from a vendor, whether you um, take it from another warehouse, whether you central buy it, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, you wanna make sure that that is correct or you won't get the right result. All right. All right, the other things to talk about, uh, meeting targets and discounts. That's another part of a buyer's job, making sure we get everything the right way. Um, there can be alternate vendors set up in the system. And on your recommended replenishment report, it does ask if you wanna show alternate vendors. Some of you may not know where to set those up, so we're gonna show that in the cross references. So let's head there next. All right, so we'll get out of our product line and we'll go to uh, our cross reference and that is ICSEC. And when you come in here, notice that you can look by product or by reference, but this is what's key. You have to look up at the top here to look for vendor to set up alternate vendors. So why would you wanna set up alternate vendors? You have your vendor on your ARP record, so you know who your, your primary vendor is, but what if, what if you want to um, order, maybe there's an opportunity to order from more than just your primary vendor. So if you look at a product, uh, we'll use 1-101 um, in my demo, my product lines are all very, my products are all very similar. Uh, 101 and vendor 201. Oh, I thought I set it up. I must not have saved it. Okay, so we'll create a new one here. So I'm saying my normal vendor is Graco, but I'm gonna buy this from Black & Decker. So I would say new here, and I'd put in my new vendor. I could put in the vendor's part number, his description, one and two. Important to put in the lead time. Sometimes you're looking for an alternate vendor, not just on price, but on availability. So it may take you 15 days to get it from your normal supplier, but if you have an alternate supplier with a five day lead time, you may choose to buy from that vendor that day. All right, and you can put in your buying unit a measure. Here's where you put in the price because you're, an alternate vendor has a different price, a different lead time a different standard pack possibly. So you can do all of your settings in here so that you know who those alternate vendors are, what the price is, what their lead time is, so that you have this available to you if you need to find another other than your primary vendor. So that's important to know. And then the other thing is where you set up those price discounting records. And I find that a lot of people don't know where they are set for a vendor. So let's look at that. So PDS, <laughs> okay, let's do it from here. Let's do it from the menu. Let's be nice. <laughs> so we're in price discounting, set up pricing. Okay, there's my, all the different records that I have. And if you drop down here, these are all customer related or product related. But again, if you look in the blue banner here, you can go to vendor records or vendor contract records. And here's where you can set up um, the different products and the different quantity breaks, right? So you can come in and you can create a new one here and say which vendor it is, what the product is what the start date, because you may have a start and an end date on this contract with a vendor. So we start today, 
And then it opens up this whole screen where you can say, here's my end date, might be out till you know the end of September. And here's what the price is. And you have the option of saying, is it a price break on quantity, weight, or cubes, right? So you have that available to you. You can put in a reference. And then here's where you set up the detail. What's the price up to what quantity? So I can say my typical price is $15, but it's $12.50 if I buy 10 or more, right? And then you can keep going until you have all the different pricing records in here and or discounts. So this is where the vendor pricing can be set up for you so that if you hit that quantity, it'll automatically flip to the contract price. So that's another key part of purchasing is making sure we're putting the right price on our PO so that when the invoice comes, AP can match to the invoice, invoice to the PO properly. All right, so that's important. All right, got to get moving here. All right, your, are your costs up to date? That would be the, the last thing to talk about, making sure that your cost is right on your PO. And of course, they're changing a lot these days, so it's hard to keep up with, but there's multiple ways of updating your costs. So if you're not sure and you're doing it manually today, please ask for some help because we can help you with that. All right standard ways to do it in the system. All right, so the next thing to talk about is paying attention to problems. So we said the big three have to be watched. So we have to look at safety, lead time, usage. So what to watch and when. So the first thing I'm gonna say is lead time. You should look at lead time exceptions, if not daily, at least weekly. Um, because if the lead times are changing, it's going to affect your order point. And that's one of your critical components of your methodology, right? So we want to look at our lead time exceptions. So those were their 50% too low or 150% too high. If they're outside of those ranges, we want to fix them and make sure that they're right. The other thing we want to watch for is unusual sales. We want to look for that every month. So at month end, there's a process called ICAMM, I-C-A-M-M, that runs, that does recalculation and also sends exceptions to the exception center for the buyers to manage. Unusual sales is one of the ones that's key for you to look at every month. An unusual sale may be that we sold more this month than we've sold in the past five months. Or it could be that we, we've been selling this product and all of a sudden we have less than a half unit per month. That's, that's the other way, you know, we have low usage on it. So high sales, low sales every month, we should look at those. We also need to look for order as needed products. So those are those that we haven't set up as stock. We don't intend to replenish it unless we have an order for it. That's why it's called order as needed. And all of a sudden, we're getting hits on it. We're selling it a lot. So your exception center will tell you to go out and look at that order as needed product. Maybe it's worthy of stocking now, and it should be changed from order as needed to stock. And reversely, we want to look at those products where we've put in a threshold Remember when I did that override threshold, even though the system told me I didn't need to order any, I said I want to keep one always. So we want to look for those thresholds that have no hits. So even though we have an ex expiration date on that threshold minimum override, um, if it's not selling at all, we want to look at it sooner. So that would be another one to look at every month. All right, so let's bring it up and just look at some of those examples. And I'm in a demo system that doesn't have any recurring usage ever. So I have trouble getting the right kind of exceptions for you to see here. But the screen to look at is ICAMU is the acronym, but it's the Product Exception Center. And every buyer should be managing their own exception center. Notice that you can run it by warehouse and by buyer, by vendor, by product line. 
Um, so I'm just going to bring up everything that's in my warehouse one exceptions. And at the top of the screen, it tells me I have 291 exceptions to deal with. And you'll see that I've got drill downs. So I've got the blue underline here where I can drill in and, and get more information. But if I scroll across, let me just collapse that screen so you can see more. As I scroll across, it's giving me basic information. It's telling me the class of the product, what the order point and line point and order quantity is. If it's frozen for any reason and you have options in your month end as to whether or not you want to freeze products, so you may see that you know, there's a frozen reason, it'll tell you the number of months that it'll be frozen for because it, it freezes in one month and then counts down. Right, so it'll say the number of months re remaining and the frozen reason. In this case, usage less than a half unit. That's telling me it's got really low sales. And so this would be one where you would look at and you would say, is this a product I still want to stock? So you can drill right in to an inquiry here and you can see information about the product right here and you can jump right to replenishment and see how it's set up today. Right, um, so you can jump jump in for more information, or you can select and drill into it, right? And you can maintain your warehouse product right from here in Cloud Suite distribution. So you can come in and you can look at what's wrong, right? So you can fix things like fixing your usage. You can come in and see what how much you have on hand and so forth. So you've got, but if I scroll down, I've got no usage. <laughs> That's what it's telling me. By the way, when you're in here looking at usage, I'm in March 2024 today in, on the calendar, but until March 2024 month end runs, I'm looking at February, January, December backwards, right? There, there won't be anything in March till my iCam updates. All right, so those are the things that you wanna look at every month, high sales, low sales, um, you can use um, a more advanced search here to find things. Um, sorry, I want to be in my exception center and bring this back over, expand it here. And I can see in my exception selection, I can look for any of these exceptions. So here's my threshold ready to expire. And here's my threshold with low activity, right? You should look at those every month. Um, here's my, I have order as needed with hits in here. Um, so there's all kinds of things in here for you to select, or you can use that exception, or you can do additional criteria here. And there's more reason codes here. Now, these are the ones that SXE used to come with before advanced inventory management even existed. There was no ICSR. Right, so these are the, the, the reasons why products would freeze in the older versions of SXE, or if you say, I wanna freeze products in your month end routine. So here's where you have 50% variance on lead time. It's a new product. I wanna see my new products, right? I wanna flag them. They'd be frozen for a certain period of months based on your, your product line settings. I wanna see if there was extensive stock out. So if there has been, I want to, I, I have to look at my usage previously and decide if I want to override my usage because if you haven't had it for more than half the month, you couldn't have sold it, right? So it could have been a, a disruption in the supply chain, but you don't want to have your order point and line point um, <clears throat> impacted by low usage just because you had a supply issue one month. So you want to see if those these where there's less than a half unit. Usage exception would be those high sales. I sold more this month than the previous five months combined. And then of course, if you have zero lead time, so you just set up a new product and you didn't put any lead time in it, you'd wanna know that too, because lead time is one of the big three. All right, so you can see um, all of the different reasons why you have exceptions, right? And just to point out in Cloud Suite, you can maintain your warehouse product from here. I'll collapse that so you can see everything. But the other thing that you can do is, is you can turn on your filter rows here. 
So you can go in and look for everything that froze in 0224, right? And, and then it would bring up a smaller list, right? So you, you've got all of these ways to, um, let's just bring that all back, sorry. I picked a bad example. All right, so you can see your frozen dates here. You can see the reason codes, right? So you can use that turn on filter rows to help you limit your list. You can also just reset this to say, um, you know, I wanna see it in ascending or descending order. Here's my B items. And as I scroll through, I should go down to more C's and D's. Okay, well, I guess I have all B's in my database. <laughs> Like I said, I've got bad data in here. Oh, here's a D, I have a D, okay. So you can use this to help you find what you're looking for. But that the important thing is you're looking for those problems and fixing them so that you, you can have good data and you can allow this system to actually re recalculate for you. So to reiterate, lead time management, you wanna look at that every day. Lead time exceptions will show up there every time receiving happens, right? So if there's more than 50% variance one way or the other in the lead time, from the time you create the PO to the time it's received, that's lead time days. And it doesn't take weekends into consideration, that's just calendar days. Uh, whether there's unusual sales, you wanna look at that every month and hits with on order as needed products or no hits on thresholds. You wanna look at those every month. Those would be our key recommendations there. All right, next, steps to getting started. If you have not trusted the system and you've been doing everything manually or you have every product frozen or you have most of your products set as human min max, right? I've, see, I've seen it a lot <laughs> because somewhere down the line, somebody didn't trust the numbers because they didn't understand where they were coming from. For practical purchasing, this would be my recommendation. Take one warehouse vendor product line to work with first. Do a cleanup of the settings, the things we talked about. Make sure that your order points, um, sorry, your, your usage, lead time, and safety are right, that those products are worthy of stocking, that they have the right status. Start with those, set those to EOQ, right? And then watch the replenishment report and your demand center and see what data cleanup is needed and manage those exceptions. Do one product line first, and then when you feel comfortable, you can do the next and the next and the next, or you can decide you're gonna turn it on for a whole warehouse. But do keep in mind some of the things we talked about at the beginning, You know, making sure that um, we understand the characteristics of the products. That's why we have multiple ordering methods right? Because not everything is the same. All right, so that, those would be my recommendations. We have six minutes left in our webinar. Um, so I'd like to ask for questions next. And the way that you'll do that is with, there's a question app at the bottom of your screen. You can put questions in there. You can also, um, you can also uh, type in the chat and I can answer questions there. Or you can feel free to email me directly. My email address is jzindel at centraldata.com. Um, and it was, I believe, in the invitation as well. There will be a posting of the recording out on our CDTV channel on YouTube. This was also recorded, and that recording will be posted there. Um, so if you don't know about Central Data TV, go out to YouTube and look for CDTV and subscribe to it because all of our webinars are there. So everything that we've done every month, which can be considered free training in a lot of ways, um, are there. All right, so I'm watching for questions if there's any. I do appreciate your time today. I know everyone is so busy and we had a, a very, uh, good response to this webinar. So I'd love to have some feedback too, if you if you got uh, anything out of it.
Thanks, Jim. I see you. All right, Mary has a question. Okay, um, I think that's a question about alternate vendors. So let me just read it to you. I have been able to set up alt vendors, but I can't get the vendor part number to appear on the PO. It only pulls the primary, even when I'm submitting through the alternate warehouse or alternate vendor. Sorry, Mary. Um, you know what, Mary? I'd like to take that offline, if I if I may. Um, I would like to email you, and I'll give you some information on things that you can check. But if we can't get to the solution in an email, I would suggest that we do a session together just so I can see the setup of your alternate vendor. Um, it could be multiple things. It could be what's what form uh, package you're using as to whether or not it'll print on the PO. So there's a couple of things we can look at. So I'll take that as a takeaway, Mary. All right, anyone else have a question? I don't see any others. Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much for sticking with me here. We covered a lot and hopefully Julie, we Julie, just demystified Julie, the one process. More Julie, oh, one more okay. question yeah. came through yeah. from Devin. Oh, okay. Uh, one more question came through. Oh, oh. Uh, is it in the chat? Oh, I see it. CDC warehouse. Okay. All right. In a CDC warehouse, it's recommended to have different ordering methods per products or standard of one method for all products. Even where you're doing central purchasing, Carlos, I would look at the characteristic of the product. I would never say that one ordering method is right for every product. Um, and if you need help with that, we can we can do a session together. But you you don't want to have just you don't want to say carte blanche that every product should be reordered the same way, even when you're central purchasing. And we got one more above that, Julie, from Devin. Oh, one more. Devin, OK, hello. How can we better communicate standard packs, stocking, selling units, et cetera, more clearly to get everyone on the same page? Well, there's a good question, Devin. <laughs> um, first of all, are you if you're using ICSEU as the, the methodology for creating your standard pack um, calculations, that would be a question I have for you. Or are you trying to do it through your SASTT unit measure uh, conversions? Um, I always recommend having standardization for how you describe the standard packs. Um, and your stocking unit of measure should always be your smallest. That That's a rule of thumb, all right? Your selling can be whatever because you know you might want to sell in multiple units of measure, but your stocking should always be your smallest. Standard packs should be set up in ICSEU and use the same verbiage. Don't don't call it a, a six pack one place and a pack of six somewhere else. You know, make it very clear what your what your uh, nomenclature is on your standard pack. But the key is on the purchasing side of thing, which, which we're most concerned about today, is that it's rounding up correctly in the demand center. If that's not working right, we need to look at it, right? Because that's, that's the key. We always want to be ordering in multiples of our standard pack. Getting everyone on the same page, I probably can't help you with. <laughs> Especially when you have a lot of buyers in a lot of different locations. But someone should, when we talk about nomenclature, we should be talking about standardization. All right, that I looks think like I got it, them all. Okay. Yeah, that's all it right. on the questions. Great job today. Thank you for that. Sure. All right.